Hello, welcome to Teachers for Tomorrow.net. This is Garth Holman and I'm my colleague in crime, Mike Pennington. How are you doing, Mike? Not too bad. How's everyone out there in cyberspace? Uh, hopefully good. Uh, today we're, we decided to uh, use Google Hangouts um, so Mike and I can stay in our respective homes and not try to drive and meet to do these web shows. And uh, we got a little treat tonight, something special to my own heart here, especially with football season coming. Um, a couple weeks ago, yeah. Mike and I sat and listened to Jim Trestle, uh, former football coach at Ohio State University and now uh, director at the University of Akron, um, give a speech on education and technology. And so we're going to play parts of that. Mike, tell us a little bit about the recording so they get a sense of how that was done. Uh, I sat at the breakfast table next to you with my iPhone and was actually able to record it uh, via that. So I, I missed the first little uh, portion of, of Jim talking, but it was just kind of introduction stuff. You know, he's warming the crowd up. Uh, so when we do start the recording, it, it's just about when he starts talking a little bit about uh, Akron's involvement with education and then his own personal uh, family history with education. So, And then as we go through, we'll stop it in parts if uh, Garth like, waves his hands so that I know that he wants to stop and talk or I might stop it as well. Yeah, as he says things that we think are relevant or, or worth talking about, we'll just take a few minutes to, to talk. So without further ado, Mike, why don't you share that video with uh, Jim Trestle speaking at the University of Akron. So again, record on an iPhone. Let's stop it there, Mike. <clears throat> I stopped it. Let me see if I can actually get my camera. Oh, you're back. <clears throat> so, so at the very beginning here, we again, like you said, we skipped a little bit, but the majority of this little chat there is a little background. So he talked a lot about uh, education being a service-oriented job, and I think uh, that's accurate, <laughs> especially yeah. accurate in some school systems where maybe you don't see the value of or, you know, maybe the community doesn't clearly value um, the work and the service that the teachers do. And I think it's important to recognize that it's still a service and it's really a service for kids and their families. So that we are in a service industry that's not always going to give us kudos for what we're doing. Sure. That's a fact. He also used, I like how he started with uh, the word passion. I mean, you know, he kind of said education is a passion. We're here because we're passionate. Uh, so that was kind of interesting to hear out of his mouth. It was that one, the passion one, and the other one that was really cool is that he, he constantly referred to his football players as, as students, you know? They, it was, it seemed very academic first, even when he was talking about his own experiences at Ohio State and the idea of success. Yeah, well, his, uh, you know, as we talk here, I'll grab his book while we listen to the next little clip, but he's got a great book out. Um, 
it's on my bookshelf here and I'll grab it. It's, it's just a great book about uh, the bigger issues in education, like life, <clears throat> life things. And that's what he, he's going to talk about a lot in this is the process of education is not just, you know, he talked about a pathway for a successful life, which isn't always standardized testing and what not really? we're walking on. <laughs> Right. It's not always that, that there's bigger issues in education that we should be trying to help kids understand and that those yeah. things are maybe more important than the true academic success, you know, on a standardized test. I think he gets to that as we progress through his talk a little bit yeah, more. But... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, uh, I said, it's interesting. You can really tell that, that he was raised in an environment where, you know, family dinners was probably talking about how the day at school went with his mom and his dad. I mean that my dad was a teacher sitting around listening to those issues. Well, we gave a... Not becoming a teacher, I think that helps me like kind of see that big global picture of the politics and the testing and, and you know, success of life and how all that plays into it more. Well, and speaking of legacy, his mom was, I think, the director of some stuff at the School of Education at Baldwin Wallace, and there's Trestle Way when you're on campus now. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's an honor of him or her. But it could be her, her husband as well, since he coached the Baldwin Wallace for years and years and years. But either way, their family, his family, has a lot of ties to education. So let's move on. Let's watch. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I said we'll get a building named after someday, maybe. Yeah, the Mike Pennington. So let's continue on. I'm going to grab that book while we're doing that. Okay. Stop there, Mike. <clears throat> Consider it stopped, sir. Good job. You're quick at that. So I know. I'm getting good at the button. Sir. You are. Well, what are your thoughts on what he said so far? Because I think this is one of the most important parts he's going to start talking about in a second. So let's take a minute and talk about what he was saying here. Well, it's kind of cool to see his background in, in technology or lack thereof. Um, I think it's interesting that when he does start talking about technology's role in his life, it was all about data <laughs> and looking at data. I mean, obviously, being a coach, uh, he's going to want to look at plays. But I mean, I, I don't know. It's just it's funny how people all of a sudden go to data. Like, how can I how can I take a database of information and break it down so that I can look at it? Um, but you know, in his job, if you want to look at successful football, you got to see how good you are at third down. You got to see how good you're at the pass play you're running. So uh, it's interesting to see how that comes in. What I wonder is when he was at Ohio State. I mean, there's so many coaches to a professional or a college football team. I wonder if there was just a team of people that sat in a room 
and stared at a computer screen and broke all that information down and looked at it for how much actual activity he had with that. I imagine, <clears throat> I imagine little. I imagine there are people that would sit and say that they would, they would, you know, basically data the tape. This is a third down play on this day, and then you can search that database. But I think what's interesting about what he's saying is the progression of technology as seen through the eyes of a football coach at a major university. And, you know, from his first job in the 1980s, I think early 80s, he was down at uh, Akron, if I'm not mistaken. But anyways, then running film to Cleveland at the end of the game, staying all night in a parking lot so he could bring it back down so everybody could watch it. That was his job. To now, yeah. film is there, and two minutes after the game, well, during the game, you can watch instant replays in high definition and see all kinds of stuff. So the progression, I think there he's just trying to give us a hint again of the progression of how technology is changing every facet of life. Sure. But I think we're, that's probably where we're at. So let's go on and hear what he has to say about that, that, that change because he has some interesting thoughts. Yeah, because, well, I was, I was going to say stop it there, too, because that was the beauty of what he was, I think the whole speech, is the beauty is right there. Well, sure, yeah, we can't make fun of him for saying about data analysis and then he quickly catches himself. But yeah, I like it, the art of what we do. You know, we can't lose sight of things. Uh, and I, as a classroom teacher, I instantly think, okay, we over, over, over analyze all this data, and we're losing sight of the art of teaching, of the child, of the actual experience that we're creating. Um, and it's cool to see a football coach see the same thing. Because there's a lot of times, especially in public education, you think of those teachers that are coaches and in a certain sport, you're like, well, he teaches so he can have a coaching job or he must not care about education because he does so much with coaching. But, you know, I work with some great football and wrestling coaches that just blow that stereotype out of the water. And and I've, I've seen one or two of them, especially the past few years, really start to see that, how the data and the technology isn't a replacement for the art of what we do. It's supposed to supplement and help inspire. So, well, I uh, think pretty interesting thing, especially. I, I, it's interesting to say to that group of people that we were sitting with and, and what they were kind of doing for those three days. Yeah, actually, we'll put a little write up at the beginning before this post. That was this was called DigiCamp Ohio. So there was a group of teachers from all over the state that were trying to learn a little bit. We'll, we'll explain a little more about that. But I think what I found interesting is it, it kept hinting to me the concept of the laws of the human that. We are in a service job. He kept talking about we're in a service job, we're in a service job, there's passion in it. And then you get so caught up in the data, you lose sight of the human nature of what we're do we do. You know, it, it's the stories we tell when we're presenting sometimes of maybe the special ed kids who the data is never going to show um, necessarily, let me rephrase that, the data may not show that they've learned a ton, but then you look at their Deagle account and how much they're on the web engaging with content but they can't remember it they're doing the work they're doing tons of work so i mean you you got it's not just data there's more to a human being than a number that's all i guess you know think of the universities that always are talking you're not a number at our university i mean there's there's more to being in school than grades yeah, I went to Iowa State. I was a number there because there were like 40,000 of us. Well, it's funny. I, you know, we were just talking about this before. Is I start school tomorrow, my professional days, and I know the first meeting we have in our building will be going over and analyzing test data. So yeah. we're, we're, we're starting off again with data, students as numbers, not, hey, we provided a great experience last year. We lived through a tragedy. We got our kids through it. Look at all the great things we did. It was... Well, hey, we got AYP, so we must have done okay. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a depersonalization again of everything. Well, and like you said, it takes away the experience. But I just think it's interesting because, I mean, this is nothing new. We, we've, all, we've said these things consistently. But to hear it from somebody at that stature who's, you know, won national championships at multiple places, 
to say, you know, it's not just data. It's not just looking at plays. It's looking at your students. Yeah. And in his case, his players and deciding what their strengths are and building on their strengths, which is what ultimately teachers should be doing, you know, building on their strengths and finding ways to minimize their weaknesses. Um, and, you know, I, I look back to all the things we talk about. And we use the metaphor at almost every presentation that we're more like coaches. So as you talked about, there are coaches that are doing great things. I mean, in some ways, I, I want to be more like a coach in my classroom. I'm not the one playing the game. I've already played the game. I've already li I'm living life. I'm 40 years old. I, I've, I've done it. You're yeah. the one playing the game now. I'm coaching you, trying to facilitate a better experience for you, but you're the one that's going to play in the game. You know, and I think that's important for kids. I, I, you know, we, you both in, in Skype conversations with all of our kids, we talk about that. So it, it's good. The kids are here on that. But well, let's go back and see what else he has to say. He has a few more things to say. Let's stop there, Mike. <clears throat> I mean, first, you might, I, I, it might be a little clearer on your end. I can't remember, I mean, I remember the speech, so I think what he was saying is the diocese was, from Columbus was in with the Pope. He asked him how he got to learn so many languages. Isn't that what he was saying? Yeah, and the, and the Pope was saying that you have to learn the, the, the rhythm and the melody of the language before you can learn the technical aspects. You know, it's like understanding who your students are and learning about their life before you're trying to be the technical part of teaching. Oh my gosh, that's, that's amazing. That so what you're saying to me is like when we do posts that say things where I go to my grad class and I say, you know, I'm not going to give you a syllabus on day one. I'm going to actually do a needs assessment and see what you know how to do and then create a syllabus. Those kind of things yeah. might actually make the art of teaching more successful. Yeah, actually giving our students a voice and what product we're giving them <laughs> so they're not changing the channel sort of say and tuning us out while they're in our room yeah i would say that uh, that was yeah that's the point you know there is a melody to i mean it. he's got it nicely we're a little bit more blunt but that's what he meant i mean you gotta understand the rhythm of what you're doing right. not just go through it right or wrong right understand who you're working with know the know yeah, the word it's, it's not tuesday so i have to teach this whether you need it or not right <laughs> Well, it's the rigid lesson plans to where um, there's that video you showed me, that one where, you know, you're supposed to be on day seven, lesson two, and you're, you know, she's, but the kids don't get it, but you're still supposed to be. And the idea is, no, you, you meet matter. your learners where they're at. The assessment will show, just keep teaching. Right. All right, move on. Let's move on a little more. Thank you. 
also have to add this, I'm not going to split screens, but a lot of people don't realize that they now have speakers inside of the quarterback's helmet so that they can tell the plays to them, and those speakers are controlled through the officials so you can turn that off. So it's not like they're memorizing these plays for no huddle offense. There's still a coach talking about Well, but I think his point is well taken, the whole stimulation factor. And, um, you know, we see it in kids, and you, you see it when you walk down the street in downtown city and everybody's on a cell phone nobody's looking where they're walking they're all on cell phones or or oh, the yeah. amount of people you see at a stop sign reading texts i mean it's just it is what it is yeah all right let's move back to it i, I don't think uh we're obviously i don't think we're going to play his whole clip because then he goes into a particular program they're going to do at akron i don't think we'll we'll play into that but we'll listen to a few more minutes I think, yeah, I think that's where we'll stop there because he, he does go on about 10 or 12 minutes about the new initiative, which is really an app. We'll just say it. It's been publicly announced. He did say he didn't want anything said until it was publicly announced, but it's been publicly announced now. Um, I think it's called the Athrum Pathway, Pathway to Success. It's an app for iPhones and everything else. But anyways, I think what he said there, you know, again, some relevant points. What do you, you want to start with? Oh, not losing the fundamentals. It's another thing we've talked about before, this idea of 21st century skills, collaboration, creativity, you know. Those aren't 21st century skills. Those are always been the fundamental skills of being educated or being a learner or being passionate about finding out answers and asking questions. So those fundamentals, I think that's why they decided to call them 21st century skills and bring them back is to somehow make them seem like they're new and amazing. But I'm pretty sure when I was in school with, Apple twos and Apple ones that they still wanted me to be a creative, collaborative learner. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's that, it's that fundamental. Yeah, if you can't if you can't if you don't have that basis, that foundation, then you're never going to be able to build on that to do anything else. Well, um, yeah, I think that the whole thrust there was, you know, if you put that in an educational context, kids still have to know how to be able to read and write. You know, they still have to be able to know how to do arithmetic. They have to know, be able to know how to do basic things. And, you know, I think that sometimes when we talk, people think we're saying that stuff's not important. And I clearly would never intentionally yeah. say that or imply that. I mean, uh, especially uh, it seems a lot of elementary teachers when I'm in grad class or when we're out will make comments about, well, what about this? And most of the time, I didn't, Im I didn't mean to imply so I think it's important to say up front, you know, that I think that many of those skills are necessary to do the kind of things we're talking about with technology. Oh, sure. I mean, as seventh grade teachers, if our students aren't getting solid foundations in their elementary educations of these things, uh, it'd be impossible for us to take a lot of our students where we take them or, and where they take themselves. I mean, you know, we give them the creative freedom and some of the tools and the inspiration to go there. But, but there's a, that important foundation that's been laid and built upon in the, in the five, six years before we see them. Right, it's, and uh, especially the writing. I mean, it seems that yeah. the writing is the thing that I'm usually most impressed with, how much kids will write in our classes, and somebody's, somebody's done a lot of work to help them get there. <clears throat> so, sure. well, I will point out his book. <laughs> huh? What would you and say? And it wasn't us. Yeah. This is, it. This is the book I was talking about. Uh, it's called The Winner's Manual. Okay, and uh, anyways... Uh, this is a rather interesting book, The Winner's Manual. Maybe we'll put a link to it if anybody's interested. You know, I think we'd be remiss to talking about this without at least mentioning the uh, obvious um, 
the obvious white elephant in this room and the fact that he was fired at Ohio State and the situation there and how that might play out with what we were just talking about. Because I find something very interesting in that, and, and it was actually in this book. I don't know how well known this is, but um, there's a section in here where he talks about it, Young State, the Youngstown State. He said, often the most difficult challenges in life are situations we can't explain. When rifle really punches you in the gut, you find out how much toughness and courage you, you truly possess. I had no idea how difficult things could become until I got a late phone call in January 1996 when I was coach at Youngstown State. The caller said there had been some kind of altercation outside the homes of Jeremy Hopkins, one of our players, and they was shot in him, uh, and that shots had been fired. Um, ultimately, it goes on to tell us he was their most popular player, All-American, and he was killed. So it happens that he was involved with some, it, it, it seems like from the rest of the reading, he was involved with some people that were um, not so good. He goes on to say that, that was one of the most difficult things when he turned him in and how difficult that was. Uh, so then I look at the Ohio State incident. You've got real popular guys really well. And as an educator, I grasp what he did and why he did it. And I'm going to give my justification sure. for that. Um, not that I think that he shouldn't have been fired or those kind of things. I'm not, I'm not going to go into that, but I will say this. There isn't a day that goes by in my classroom that kids don't break the rule somehow in the school, and I don't bust every single kid for breaking a rule. I try to teach them how not to make mistakes like that and to do the right thing, to make better choices. And so in some ways, I think that he was attempting to do that. I think he probably, in this particular case, bad judgment. But, you know, I think you can't help but at least discuss that a little bit because I'm sure that everybody that sees it, that's the first thing they'll think of. Here's a guy talking about integrity and, and you know, where, where is he coming from? Yeah, and I mean, that's a that's a really hard line to find. Like, when does a student's problem become so big you can't or you shouldn't handle it inside the classroom as yourself? Especially as educators, we're always told by our main offices, you know, handle discipline. You know, the office isn't for discipline anymore. It, it's a classroom thing. But... I mean, yeah, that's hard. I mean, it, and it's hard to tell what turn something's going to take. I mean, something could be very minor, and you could think it's handled uh, and close, and it comes back. You know, we work in a middle school. They're, they're 12, 13-year-old kids we're working with. Uh, there's no such thing as promises and secrets, and I'll never do it again. And uh, I think you learn that pretty quick as a teacher in your first year or two. But there's always that one student who makes a mistake or does something, and, and it's something that you should let the office handle, but you think, you know, like you said, I can teach that student to do better, to make better decisions, uh, and it ends up backfiring. So, so it's really, it's really hard. Yes, it is. And so I think, uh, I think you you made a great point there because it really is. Sometimes we do think we can handle more than we can, and you're right, blows up in our face. And I've had that happen. And, and I'm sure. Yeah. Well, and I'm sure I mean, you know. Have. I mean, I know I have stories that I'll never forget. Things that keep me up at night sometimes. That ways to handle things better with students or. Uh, and I'm sure that he feels that same way because he seems to, even when he was coaching, I mean, he's always had a pretty personal relationship with his players and his students. And, and I mean, that story from Youngstown State, um, when you play football in college at a major university, your coach and you are pretty much around each other 24 hours a day. I mean, they keep track of your academics, your, right. your free life, what you're doing. Um, it, it's, it's very much like a father figure. And, you know, for those kids, that's the first time they're away from home probably. Uh, and, and they have a pretty rigorous schedule. I mean, I'm not going to say whether or not they're giving breaks on their scheduling, but right. I mean that that's, that's, a, that's a that's a rigorous thing to do. I mean, it's not it's not easy. It's easy to say, oh, they just play football and then they go to classes. Well, they they really I mean, their days were much longer than my days at Ohio State. I bet you. No, I'm sure. Well, I think we should go. We're almost at uh, 30 minutes actually for this recording, so I think we'll uh, wrap it up from here. Any last thoughts? Well, I wouldn't want to listen to me. No. Uh, well, I start school tomorrow. I'm really excited. You know, we have three days of uh, professional development and, and, and speakers, and on Thursday the kids come, and uh, I have a new principal, new system principal, so I'm really looking forward to this school year. It's going to be uh, it's the year of optimism. That's well, tag this I have one more uh, one more week left. My wife starts tomorrow here in the local school district, and then the kids start on Wednesday, so I will actually have three days of summer break with nobody home. So it'll be interesting. <laughs> You're lucky. Yeah. So... Anyways, with that said, we will uh, try to get back to you and, and see how things go throughout the start of the school year for everyone. Uh, from teachersfortomorrow.net, have a good night.